From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ronald Kenworthy, Mr. Dollar. Good. I want to talk to you. Are you at your home? I am. And after the Okay, then stay right there and I'll be over to see you. Why don't you send the police instead? What's that supposed to mean? A few minutes ago in Mrs. Van Pyten's library, before you kicked me out, you practically accused me of the murder of her nephew. Did I? Well, didn't you? Didn't you? All right, Ronnie. Just calm down and stay put until I can get over there. (laughs) You mean you aren't afraid I might try to take a powder, as you high-handed detectives like to put it? You mean you aren't worried that... Uh. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is the final report in my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope matter. The whole case started out almost as a lark when I discovered that I'd come to Philadelphia to act as bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas and for a fat fee and virtually unlimited expense accounts. Me, bodyguard to a dog. But it ceased to be funny when I learned that the dog's two previous caretakers had been murdered. And when, only a few hours ago, an attempt was made on my life that ended with the death of young Warren Staley. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I see. I guess I was so upset by the death of my nephew that I... I didn't realize the attempt was really made on your life. The second attempt, Mrs. Van Pyten. What? Shortly after I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody planted a booby trap in my suitcase in my hotel room. Good heavens, No. And you think that Ronald Kenworthy did that, too? Well, what do you think? Well, yes. Now that poor dear Warren is gone, there's nothing to prevent the Kenworthy estate from achieving control of the Van Pyten holdings. That is, if I were to die. Go on. Upon the death of Harrison Kenworthy, the whole financial empire would be inherited by his son, Ronald. So I understand. Ronald... And he would be the wealthiest, the most powerful man financially in the United States. Ronald, who pretended to be Warren's best friend. Who pretended to love me. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Apparently adds up, though, doesn't it? There is no question of it. But what evidence have you? None yet. Well, then I'll help you get it. And I can do it, Mr. Dollar. I may appear to be only a wealthy, foolish old woman who dotes on her pet, Laird Douglas. But I'm not. I'm astute, shrewd, and clever. Since Peter, my husband, died, I alone have managed this estate, this financial empire. I use the word again. With my money, with my... Oh, yes, I can do it, Mr. Dollar, and Ronald will be made to pay for these terrible things that he's done. I, uh... I admire your confidence. Nothing. No one can stand in my way. You see, I'm only sorry that a few minutes ago you didn't keep him here, make him face it. I'm going to see him now. Oh, where? At his home. I understand the estate adjoins this one. Yes. But please, look out for him. Shoot first, Mr. Dollar. What? Because now he may act like the cornered rat that he is. I decided to walk across to the Kenworthy estate in the hope the fresh air would help clear my thoughts. Logical as it all seemed, I didn't like what i just heard. Then luck, pure, unadulterated luck. As I walked across the broad lawn between the main house and the gatehouse, I passed the garage building with its Rolls Royce, two Cadillacs, and a station wagon. And then I saw him. Andy LaFord, alias Andy Fortune, alias Andrew Ford, one of the cleverest second-story men in the country, with a record on the West Coast as long as your arm. A man who would do anything for money. He was hardly going through the motion of dusting off a car. I walked past quickly, not sure whether he'd noticed me or not. I hope not. For it was one of his ilk who'd had to plant the booby trap in my hotel room, who could have slipped the poison into the liquor that killed Warren Staley. I turned in at the gatekeeper's house. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I saw you at the question. I want to telephone young... quick. Uh, well, yeah, uh, right here, sir. It's something Thanks. Wrong with... oh. 
Operator, get me Central Police emergency. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Something The man there in the garage, polishing cars. Uh, Andy? How long has he been here? Oh, a year more. Ever since the dog showed Valley Kidd. Well, what does he do? Year. Oh, the driving for Mrs. Van Payton, but there's something gone. Hello? On. Give me Lieutenant Howard, homicide. <laughs> Old gatekeeper, then I'd have his head if had anything to anyone about my phone call. I left by the back door and went over to the Kenworthy mansion where young Ronald was waiting for me. I must say, before we go any further, that I resent the way you ordered me out of the Van Pyten house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Whether you suspect me or expect me to help you in this case, it was Lonnie, hardly... you knew Warren Staley. Very well. We were the closest of friends. Confident. All right. Just how much did he really care about the Van Pyten estate? Fortune, whatever you want to call it. To put it bluntly, he wanted none of it. And I'm afraid his aunt rather resented it. Well, why do you say that? Because her whole life, she's been obsessed by an almost overwhelming lust for power... When Warren finally rebelled against this, she tried not to show it, but she hated him for it. Unlike my father. Oh? I feel as Warren felt. And my father and I together have been laying the groundwork for dissipating the Kenworthy estate into corporate setups that will benefit many instead of just us. Does that sound strange to you? Well, it sounds like true philanthropy, if you mean it. You must believe me, it is, and I do mean it. Oh, I won't suffer, of course. I'll still retain some control here and there, but I'll have to work at it instead of just carrying on the tradition of the idle rich. I'll be a man. I hope you're telling me the truth, Ronnie. I believe you are, and I'd like to meet your father. You will. Needless to say, it was much harder for him to break from this tradition of financial power than for me. So perhaps you can see why I admire him above all other men. Anything else? I'll see you later. I was worried about you, Mr. Dollar, going over there to see Ronald Kenworthy alone after all that has happened. Yes, you should have been, Mrs. Van Pyten. Especially if you noticed that I passed by the garage on the way. What? I happened to notice someone there, and I think it answered a lot of questions for me. It was Andy LaForte. Andrew? My private chauffeur? Is that all he is? Oh, do you know him, Mr. Dollar? Look... I took on this case, Mrs. Van Pyten, because you offered me a fee too good to be turned down and an almost unlimited expense account. You haven't answered my... I should have got wise then and there. But I thought your great passion for your dog was just an amusing foible of an immensely wealthy, kind of foolish old lady. Oh, Laird Douglas is a dear one, isn't he? Why, Mr. Dollar... Let me add things up. A few minutes ago, you told me that thanks to your wealth and a very sharp, clever mind, you'd let nothing stand in the way of anything you chose to do. Please, Mr. Dollar, I don't think I understand. All right. You made a contract with Harrison Kenworthy that you'd marry him when and if Laird Douglas beat that pup of his at the dog show. An apparently silly sort of thing, yet everybody believed it. But the real reason for marriage to him was solely to acquire control of his holdings, increase this financial empire of yours. Very subtle. Kept you looking like a cute, whimsical old lady. Why, this is the most absurd thing I ever heard of. So I thought at first, but let me go on. Oh, please do. When you realized that Laird Douglas wasn't ready to beat that dog of his, rather than admit defeat, rather than lose the chance to make this marriage, you ordered the murder of the dog's handlers. <sighs> then the contract was still in force, just delayed. I won't listen to such terrible things. You'll listen whether you like it or not. You learned that Kenworthy and his son were planning to dissipate their fortune and thereby put it beyond your reach. Mr. On Dollar... On top of this, your own nephew, Warren, wanted to do the same with your estate. This was too much. What you have said is too much. Then, by the time I arrive, you learned from an expert, Ray Rowland, that your dog would never stand a chance against Kenworthy's. So you wouldn't dare let him compete, at least until you'd hooked Kenworthy some other way. And part of your whole scheme was to build up evidence of attempts against you, through the dog, of course, though I'll bet you actually hate the mutt. No, that's not true. Anyhow, from the moment I talked to Ray Rowland, I was only in the way. So you tried to get rid of me, had somebody booby-trap my luggage. Oh, you have no proof. Andy LaForte, this so-called chauffeur of yours, would do anything for money. And I fully intend to break him down and make him admit you hired him as a killer. Listen. Listen to me. On the second try, the poison liquor, your nephew Warren got it instead of me. Fine, fine. Another obstacle out of your way. After all, he had opposed you. Mr. Dollar, how much do you want? I can make you financially independent. Then for the you rest set of... your sights on Ronald Kenworthy, who was trying to break up the other empire you wanted to get your hands on. You even hoped that somehow I might help you. Shoot first, you said. You don't understand. I was Just what only... plans you had for his old man and that warped, twisted brain of yours, I don't know. But I'm sure you had plans. 
Well, lady, now it's too late. No, Mr. Dollar. No, it isn't too late. Stay away from that drawer. You'd even shoot somebody down with your own hand if you thought it necessary, wouldn't you? But it isn't necessary, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Are you sure it wouldn't be easier if I were just to give you, say, a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand? All right, Andrew. Right here, Mrs. Van Pyten. Well, well. Hello, Andy. Got a license for that thing? Shut up. You want me to do it now, Mrs. Van? Yes, Andrew. Uh, what if the servants hit a shot? Hold it, Donna. Don't worry, Andrew. I'll take care of things. Haven't I always for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. She'll take care of things. While you're pulling that trigger, she'll blast you down so fast you won't know what hit you. Make it look like we killed each other and leave her in the clear. Quiet. She's got a gun in that drawer beside her and she'll use it. You hear me, Eddie? I said quiet. What you don't know is that she can't do without me. <laughs> but we can do without you. All right, Andy, wait now. Listen, will now, you? Now, Mrs. Van. All right, Andrew. Now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Oh, Lieutenant. Uh, th then you saw he was going to shoot down Mr. Dollar. Yes, I oh, heard, yes. too, Mrs. Van Pyten, plenty. Oh, oh no, you, you don't understand. Mr. Dollar had come up here to talk to me. I wanted to offer him a great deal more money for his work for me. I guess didn't I almost I, didn't Dollar, make it. Glad money, you keep talking to him so then long. This Got a cough drop. The Is this body the end of the forge? Oh, the shut the up. Uh, what was that? You heard him. I beg your pardon. Clever, shrewd, astute. You're just off your rocker. You'd have to be, I guess, to start a thing like this in the first place. Well, I guess by the time the estate and inheritance laws get properly applied, the Van Pyten Empire will be spread around the way Warren wanted it. Expense account item 10, $28.90. Fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total, including fees, $1,113.40. Remarks? I'm glad I'm poor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, an insurance swindle that really backfired. The only trouble was it caught me right in the line of fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Jeanette Nolan, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Jack Crucian, Bill James, James McCallion, Ken Christie, Dick Ryan, Bert Holland, Jack Edwards, and Hi Everback. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Thank <laughs> you.